Okay, I want to tell you three things about that, and then we'll take a couple of questions, and I have some more to talk about. The first thing is that that's the most inspirational work I've ever done as a judge. The changes I saw in the people, and there were men and women, but mostly women, 95%, were so dramatic I didn't believe it. Somebody would walk into court and I would say, there's no way that this is ever going to work out. After I read this petition, saw the police reports, and saw everything, and then I would watch the transformation take place. Second thing is, we've been evaluated. Had a federal evaluator live in my court for five years. I've got the full report if you want it. They were out of Portland. If you want the report, the model that we use reworks. Okay? The third thing is, I hope you looked with envy and said, do you mean those women and those children have beds that are recovery beds, both intensive and transitional? Why, we don't have those in our community. How did that happen? And I'll tell you how it happened. Because I expect you to be able to do something similar in your county. I went to the Board of Supervisors. And I sat down with them, and the head of drug services. And I said, here's the budget for drug treatment services in our county. You will notice that almost all the money goes to men. And I want to tell you that I believe that the most important dyad in our community are mother and children. And so how about dividing it up a little bit so that women and children have a substantial portion, not all, but fair share of drug treatment resources? I happen to be talking to a female member of the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> and she took charge. And we have a bunch of beds now, just a bunch of beds. And everybody realizes that this is the most cost-effective, best intervention that we could make on behalf of our community. You've got to think about your community as a whole. And your community as a whole is not necessarily providing most of your services for guys. I'll say no more about that. The last thing is, we are so happy about drug court that two things are happening. We've decided that everybody who comes in the court is going to get this level of services. But we have a specialized court, and we just got a federal grant for this, for all positive toxicology babies born in our county. We figure it's about 200 a year. Alcohol, meth, whatever drug. That they are all going to be in an intensive infant's drug court with their moms and dads, if the dads are there, but sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Our community is so excited about this that everybody wants to be in the room. The consultant for this grant is Dr. Barry Brazelton. Huh? You know, NPR? This, you know about this? Huh? Eye contact, brain development, all that stuff. We got the we got the master, and we are going to do this, um, whether or not a petition is filed. And I was talking to the judge, the judges yesterday about this. If a petition's not filed, they nevertheless are going to have voluntary service, so-called voluntary services, and they sign a contract, and part of that contract is to come to court and see the judge. Because I believe, and I think the, the evidence approve, uh, uh, demonstrates this, that there's something very powerful that happens when an authority figure pays attention to someone and cares about the result that that person is seeking in her or his life. And coming to see the judge with regular progress reports is the magic that I think drives the drug court. There are many other parts of it, but that's... That's the nub of it, in, in my view. But of course, I'm a judge, so I probably am prejudiced. And this is what the report said about our drug court. Treatment started faster, more treatment episodes, higher rate of reunification, get your children back sooner, children spend less time in foster care. I mean, yes, evaluation's another thing that you take 
to the legislature. As a result of this evaluation, both the federal government and the state of California are now funding drug courts because they know they work because the, they've evaluated it themselves. Okay, now we're going to talk about something else. Unless you want me to stop right now and somebody wants to ask a question about that. Yes. Just wondering if the report evaluated re-entry. Meaning families that were dismissed and relapsed. Well, we keep track of that. It's, uh, it's a small percentage, but there are some. And we think that's a very important part of the drug court environment that we're trying to create in our community. And there are several things that we do. The woman who started off uh, saying uh, she was driving, Barbara, um, is, was hired by the lawyers who represent parents. And she started what we call the Mentor Mom Program. So we have paid graduates who mentor the new people coming into the drug court. And when we went to the all sites meeting of model courts, we told about this, and it was immediately nominated as the most imaginative program, and every drug court adopted it overnight. Just I mean, why not? So the mentor becomes someone who is tied to the person after the dismissal. We're very concerned about what happens after dismissal. I was in my, I did a study in the drug courts in Miami, and Miami is cocaine center, and they have fabulous rehab facilities there. They have whole blocks of old motels they've taken over. But the problem with Miami is the relapse rate when they go back home. And so we really work on that. So there are two things that we do with the court. We have a Thanksgiving dinner every year, which gets bigger and bigger every year. Hundreds of people come. Free dinner. We get a service club to pay for it. To re-energize everybody. And we do the same with a summer picnic. Where we just want people to know that there are safe places in the community where they can come, clean and sober places, where we value the parenting relationship that you've demonstrated in your time in our drug court. We also have tried to develop groups, and you saw the Miller House group there, of the, all those women were in the drug court, but some of them had graduated, but they keep coming back to the group. And so to me, this is, we all need to strategize on how we can build a clean and sober community by putting things in at different places that will support parents and their children to stay away from drugs. So what have we learned? The cases that come back, we study very carefully. And they include uh, isolation. The, the woman who becomes isolated, kids overwhelmed, gets depressed. And we had a couple of those that came back to us. And the other thing is the bad boyfriend returns with party time and everything goes downhill. So we spend a lot of time in drug court working on relationships. And that's a very tough issue. In order, in order to, the step one of the case plan is you're moving out from Mr. Mr. Violent. She says, but I love him. I say, fine. You want your kids back? This is, this is the step you have to take. That's very tough, tough stuff. Because she'll say, I don't want it. And we'll say, well, your chances of getting your kids back will probably be reduced because you have, you, you continue to be victimized and you continue to use drugs with him. But choosing between your boyfriend and your child is one that is an eternal issue. And the drug court works very hard to get the mother to move in the correct direction. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm, you know, with, with what you're saying, if you allocate optimal resources to a problem area, you're likely to have better outcomes. But in an era of diminishing resources, financial resources in particular, that there are many, many communities such as ours that are, that are looking at significant uh, financial shortfalls. I was wondering if you have any ideas of various strategies that communities like ours can use to ensure that these kind of critical services that we're looking for for families and children can take priority over other competing services. The, to summarize the question, how can a community that doesn't have the resources that I've talked about uh, do it? Okay, I'm going to say two things. First of all, you are wealthier than most communities I talk to. Okay? 
you are wealthier. I have communities that I talk to that have essentially two things, a visit to the court and AANA, both of which are essentially free, but they need transportation. That's what I call bare bones. But if you have that judge-client relationship and you have consistent attendance at AANA, you can do it. Okay, that's, that's the bare bones, and you got more than that. But secondly, I don't want you to be satisfied with what you have because I just gave you a little anecdote about how our community built resources based on taking a look at what you currently have and shuff, just move, not, not creating new resources, but modifying existing resources to reflect the needs of women and their children. And remember, this, this country is essentially a male-driven country. That's the way we came in. And, and looking at our women with, the, with their own unique problems, women and babies have not been first and foremost in our, in our public systems in many communities.